Good morning and welcome to a conversation with Francis Mays and Kim Sune about Francis's new book, A Place in the World, Finding the Meaning of Home. Um, she's joined this morning by Kim Sune, who is a cookbook author, um, a memoirist. Um, her memoir, 2009, Trail of Crumbs, um, explores the role of home, of food, of family and connection. Um, Francis, of course, has written extensively about travel and journeying. And in this book, um, she is sort of responding to those places and the pleasures of home, um, taking us from the South to Tuscany um, and other places. It's just a beautiful book. It came out this past Tuesday. Um, this morning's event is brought to you by Rakestra Books. I'm Michael Barnard. I own Rakestra Books and Warwick's Books in La Jolla, California. And we are absolutely thrilled to be working with our friends at Warwick's. Happy to have Francis back, even virtually, and so pleased to meet Kim. So Francis is going to talk about the book for a couple minutes, and then I will bring Kim back on screen. They will chat for about half an hour, 35 minutes, and then I will come back and moderate questions from all of you. Um, if you have questions, feel free to drop them into the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen. And up uh, there's Julie from Warwick saying hello. Um, and then if you can, um, order books, if you're closer to Warwick's order a book from Warwick's, if you are closer to Rakestraw books, um, order from us. And uh, I know that both of us will be very happy to ship. So if you're out of the area and you'd like to support us, I know we will both be happy to get orders. So thanks for being here. Um, Kim and I are going to disappear and then, uh, Francis is going to talk for a few minutes. Michael, thank you. Michael came over to Tuscany for a little bit this summer, so we had a chance to visit. And Julie, thank you. Reichstraw and Warwick's are two of my very favorite bookstores. And I've been to a lot of bookstores on tours and they do such a wonderful job. I wish we were there in person, but it's wonderful to be here with people from so many places. So my new book just came out last week. Very exciting. I love the cover. It's by um, Nell Blaine. She's a Southern artist. She's no longer with us, but it just kind of said to me exactly what my book was about. The landscape outside, which is alluring, but the wonderful interior that grounds you. So I, I saw this painting. I said, I've got to have that as the cover. I wrote this during uh, COVID. I doubled down during that time and actually wrote two books during that. I also moved twice, which as everyone knows is a crisis in itself. And I was overseeing a restoration project here at Bramasole. I'm in Tuscany, it's 6.30 here. We're across many time zones because Kim is in Alaska and it's very early for her. So I saw someone's from Brazil. So we're just all over the place with time. And time is one of the questions in this book that we'll talk about later. But I was overseeing a, a restoration project here at Bramasoli, where I live now for donkey's years, just forever. I think this is our third major restoration so that's been going on, it's kind of still going on. But all that happened during COVID, but there was also that gift of time. Not everything was too horrible, but because we all got a chance to reassess things and to see what we really wanted. I started writing the book because I was living in a place I thought was my forever home, not to sound like a rescue dog, but I thought I was going to live there forever. It was a farm. It was a world. It had a huge garden. It was on the river. And I had lived there 12 years thinking, no matter what happens, this is a world. I even couldn't leave here. It would still be enough. And during COVID, I didn't realize at the time it was a phenomenon all over the that people were moving and created that huge housing boom where prices went out the window and everyone was kind of reassessing. I didn't realize that at the time, 
but I think in times of crisis like that, it does make you examine the ground you're on. I've always been a traveler. When I was a very tiny child, I started wanting to have a little suitcase of my own. And I always had the vision of myself as, as a traveler. And I've written many books about travel, about place, mainly um, Italy, but a place in the world. I mean, a year in the world was about lots of places. So in that time of being at home a lot and then moving, I was really reassessing what is home and uh, why do you stay in a place or why do you go? And thinking of in my life, there's always been this big balance between travel and the pull of home because I'm also really a domestic, domesticated person. And these questions kept coming up and I started looking through other writing I had done and I realized that home had been almost as big a subject to me as travel. The two passions, obsessions were equal. So I pulled together some of the essays I'd written about momentary homes and, and places I would like to have lived as well as uh, places that I had lived. And then I wrote a whole lot of other material. And it was really a joy to put this together and to really deeply consider um, what home is. And I wasn't really able to get with any definitive answer, but it just raised questions to me that were interesting. And to me, the questions are always more interesting than the answers. So that's what this book is about. And now maybe we can talk about it with Kim. There she is. <laughs> All right, so I'm not frozen, am I? No, you're here. Um, Kim and I have been friends forever. And every time we get together, we just cook like maniacs. <laughs> She's <laughs> such a wonderful cook. It's you, how fun! How fun to be in the kitchen with you, Francis. Yes, um, it's never fun. Thank you for including me in this. Your book is so beautiful. The the writing is incredible. I remember when you talked about um, writing this book, and it made sense to me because, you know, some of the things you said about questions and how they're all they're often more important, but the, to go back to time and home and travel, it's almost like you can't have one without the other in some ways. Um, and yes. I don't know how you do it. Every time I see you, you're, you're in one place for six months and then you're off somewhere else. But you, I think one of your superpowers <laughs> is being able to be at home and at ease and even the most strange places. How do you do that? <laughs> It's a very mysterious thing, the, the where you feel at home, where your kind of metabolism connects with the place. Like, it's so odd that I can be in a, a hotel for three days and, it, you know, at the end of the day, running all around all over the place, I hear myself saying, well, let's go home. And I'm talking about the hotel room, you know, how you start, sort of start <laughs> right. making yourself at home wherever you are. And that's kind of an odd phenomenon. But one chapter in this uh, book is called Momentary Homes. And I think that's what you're talking about, that, you know, more of a thing like you go somewhere and you really feel at home there and you're not and you're not going yes. to be. You're not going to live there. But for some reason, you do feel at home there. And in writing about this, I, I came to realize that those kinds of situations are almost always at some crux in your life. Like I wrote a chapter about Mexico. It was at a time I was getting a divorce and I didn't really know what the future was, but I immersed myself in that country and realizing things about being at home there and that I was not going to live there somehow impelled me to make decisions when I got home in the same with France, I went to cooking school, as you well know, with Simone Beck, who was the co-author with Julia Child of Mastering the Art of French Cooking. And I was putting my family first. Everything revolved around my family. And I got the wild idea I was going to this cooking school and just took off. 
And when I got there, I had never been there. And it was in those rose fields near grass. And her kitchen was mm. just fantastic to cook in. And she would say things like, are we going to measure or are we going to cook? And I just took to her independence and kind of fierceness. <laughs> as well as the place it was my first experience of a place like i came to love tuscany walking in those rose fields and driving around to these beautiful shaded towns and seeing how the french really lived i thought people live like this you, you can do this <laughs> and I went home from there. I went to graduate school. I became a writer and it was that experience that gave me the impetus to to do that. I came out of there thinking, you know, change has to happen. And then years later, I have this place in Tuscany that has that same country rural feel, that lovely connection with nature and you know, just rained here today and there's this scent of pine and cedar and grasses and it just connects right back to that place. And there were other places in the book, Capri and um, for other places in France that also had that same kind of that sense of home and that sense that when you feel that somewhere do something else, maybe something you need to do. I, I didn't hear that last part, Francis. I just said it kind of spurs you to do what you need to oh. do. <laughs> what you need to do, no, and you know, to go back to um, about time and you were talking, especially during, during the early part of the pandemic, um, I think it made us, what I, what I learned from your book, you give us this gift and this insight that living in a beautiful landscape changes you. And when simple, I think you wrote, when simple everyday life feels like a gift, you, you respond in surprising ways. And we can't all live in beautiful Cortona, um, but I think that we can take some of those lessons about time for all of us, wherever we are, you know, to just slow down, take a look at everything, literally smell the roses or the magnolias or camellias, which are so sharp um, in your book. You know, and I, I kind of felt that way about Alaska here is that I lamented for a long time everything that I didn't have, everything that was missing. I was moving here uh -huh. and I remember my friend James said, you'll make new friends. And I said, well, I like my old friends, <laughs> you know, but you talk about these small gifts and, um, you know, really taking the time to be present and be where you are and, and have the sense of community, which I'm so grateful for that I've been able to create that here as yes. well. Um, so there's so many lessons in your book, I want to say for all of us about oh, that. Um, I know you and I both... Alaska was a very foreign territory to you. You made the most of it. Yes. You just, I, every time <laughs> I see posts from you of what you're cooking and they're always friends around and you're writing the newspaper and writing a novel and, but also responded to the landscape itself, the wildness and the gorgeousness of the landscape. And, you it's, know, I think yeah. that kind of connection with the place really is influential. Like Tuscany, is beautiful. It is a pleasure to just look out the door because it's beautiful. And I think if you're lucky enough to live in a place that's beautiful, it does do that that thing to you. It, it you absorb the sense of beauty, and you want your life to be that way. I think it's also you know aspects of the culture. I never talked to you about that part of living in Alaska, but here there's just this generosity um, comes partly from an intense sense of community. And I grew up in the American right. South where there was this intense sense of community. So I've um, realized that here in Italy as well, that that is one of the things. But the thing that has startled me the most, and I have a 
whole chapter in my book about that is the gift. People are constantly giving you something here. And you find a bag of ricotta on your gate or a basket of figs or uh, some flowers. It just the constant exchange of gifts here just I still I still just can't get over it. I had a basket of figs today and I made a fig and walnut tart. But the the giving to you makes you generous too. It makes you give back and so there's this right. kind of constant interchange of gifts. And that I think that is what goes a long way toward making people feel at home once they've moved here. They're brought into this uh, constant giving uh, and I was trying to figure out in my book where that came from and I think it comes from living in the beautiful place that opening you up I to can't the... help but share hmm? right. oh right yeah you can't oh, help yeah. but share but I decided it, help came, but share. it also came it came from art there's so much art and you write about. art is a gift to us. So I think that that constant sense that you live in a place with art makes you also generous. Can you hear me? Are we frozen? Can you hear me? Hello. Oh, yes, I can hear you now. No, you can and, hear me now. And actually, in the book, you also, I can hear you. Okay. You, can you hear me? Now um, I can. You do, you write a you write in the book about going back to Italy during the uh, pandemic and you were allowed back in because you um, you had Brahma Sole. Yes. But Italy was kind of, was it code orange at that point? What, what was that like to return to a place you call home and everything is completely changed? And, and there weren't many people different. there, right? You said at the time? No, yeah. there were. There were Did you feel a stronger yeah. pull? Uh, yes, I um, I was stunned, first of all, because there was no nonsense about wearing masks and things like that. Everybody came forward and did what they needed to do. And um, I think being here at that time was, for me, one of the best times during the whole thing because I was able to have just endless time to do creative things and, and to work on my projects. So um, I loved being here, but we were under lockdown here like we never had in America ever. I mean, you, you had to fill out a piece of paper with the police to go beyond your yeah. immediate surroundings. And you had to line up and go in the grocery store one at a time. And uh, nobody left, nobody misbehaved. It was amazing. And they did what they needed to do. But also, you know, the plague happened in Europe in the 1300s, and memory is long in Europe. So they still remember the plague in their DNA and their old doors of the dead in town where they used to take the plague dead out. There's a, the remnant of the old plague house. So there's still, you know, a sense of knowledge that half the population can get wiped out. It's it made them really look up and do the right thing. You know? Still deeply haunting. Um, speaking of 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 that and and being haunted, there is a, this is a little switch of a subject, but you know, you and I both view food, I think, as touchstones. And there's this really charming chapter, and I don't know where this came from, but there's a section in the book. Um, called is it the ghost in the kitchen or the non ghost? Well, it's a non ghost ghost, right? So for it those of you who haven't read the book yet, I, I, it's a. I love this. I love this section, and I don't know, Francis, if you want to talk a little bit about it because I think it's 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 haunting and charming, but it brings the question of you know, food and how does it both transform and haunt us in these food memories and taste memories. So do you want to tell us a little bit yeah. about that yeah, ghost, the ghost in the kitchen? The ghost in the kitchen. 
a, a long time ago, I read this book called The Poetics of Space by Gaston Bachelard. And one thing he said in that book is the house should protect the dreamer. And I've always loved that quote because, you know, thinking about what is home. I mean, home is four walls and it's the where you are protected from the wolf. You know, home is where you are protected. But he says it protects the dreamer. And I've thought about that a lot because mm -hmm. the, the, that the house does protect the dreamer. It gives you gives you the, the place where you are creative. It's the place when, when you're very young, you have a vision of yourself. And my vision was I wanted to be free. I wanted to be a voyager in the world. I wanted to be a writer. Yeah. And I have felt that my homes have helped me be those things and sometimes in mysterious ways like the ghost in the kitchen i have insomnia always and in my farmhouse in chatwood i don't believe in ghosts at all i think anybody right, starts telling me about right, a ghost i don't want to hear it <laughs> i don't want to hear it but i kept i was awake and I, these smells were coming up the stairs and i could smell things being cooked and I would creep down into the kitchen because it was so strong. This happened maybe four times. And I knew right. that there was like no very ghost. specific re sense. <laughs> yes, very specific. It was you were, almost you like smelled recipes. A pasta with four cheeses, right? <laughs> yes, pasta with sausage and four cheeses was one of them. And um so there was no ghost. I would go down and you know, turn on the light and everything's normal. But about a month after that, I started writing a cookbook and I had not planned to write a cookbook. Right. But I think this, this, um, the way the house gave me these uh, senses of something is being prepared for you kind of came from living mm. in this house. That sounds a little mystical, but I just didn't know where this idea for the cookbook came from because I've written one and I'm not a person who likes the quarter teaspoon, you know, and the eensy pinch of salt right. and this kind of stuff. So cookbooks are really hard for me to write. But I got the idea I'm going to do a pasta cookbook. I've always loved pasta. We have pasta all the time. I have so many great recipes. So that what came from the that? ghost who cooks. So I think, you know, the house the house that is your home, you interact with it. It gives you things. It gives you things you didn't have. And after I wrote that chapter, I started thinking about how I love the houses of my friends. And you think of your friend the in that place is. when I'm missing someone, I think of you know their whole context and where they are and what they might be doing in their house, sitting on their porch, drinking iced tea or pulling up weeds or doing whatever they do. So in this book, the houses of friends became really important. I wrote maybe 12, 10 or 12 descriptions of my friends' houses, which I also wanted to be a description of them. And that was really fun. I My friends haven't seen this yet, so I hope they like it. Oh, <laughs> it will. You know, you've also included some wonderful recipes in the book, you know, cakes from your mother. Um, and you, a friend of yours, speaking of this chapter, wrote that comfort food is sort of like recatching a dream, which I think is so lovely. Um, and how does a dish become a symbol of home? I think food Do is you home. Think you? you know, there's the taste of home. You it taste awesome. it, you yes. know exactly what you had there. And even when you think of friends' homes in your childhood, you can remember what their mothers made. Edna Lula Ward's mother's potato salad, you know, all these things, the church dinner on the grass and uh, just home and food are just kind of the very same thing. And in my home, my mother made monumental cakes and she <laughs> the way you describe that is just amazing she's like, come into the dining room. Have... <laughs> mm -hmm. 
it was like presenting you know something to the queen or something she'd bring these cakes into the <laughs> dining room and her um lemon cheesecake and it wasn't a cheesecake it was just a lemon curd kind of cake and lane cake and right. you know the german chocolate Coconut. cake and all these things i just mostly remember her cake but also you know things that my aunts cooked and that was another thing I decided to extend to my friends. I asked several friends, what was the food that really meant home to you? So that was a fun part to write, just friends from England or Australia, America, Italy. What this Danish friend of mine, I said, what do you call something like soul food in Denmark? You know. If you didn't want to say soul food, what would you say? He said life, he said the Danish word, life, life food. Dish. And I love that term, life food. So you, you could make a list. I'm sure everybody could make a list of 25 things that they right. consider life food. Their life food, exactly. Yes. And the, you say the food of home. Yeah, the, the, um, the Tuscan food, comes so much of the Tuscan tradition comes from cucina povera, the poor kitchen. And it's still such an important yes. aspect of Tuscan cooking, the foraging, the appreciation of the seasons. I mean, there's no broccoli here right now. There are no asparagus here. There are no oranges here. They're not interested in importing things that are out of season. But the cucina povera is, you know, even if you're just making a little pasta, you can go out and grab some mushrooms or just do a bunch of herbs, just the kind of simplest thing from when they didn't have much money to buy anything. They still had their olive oil. They still had things they foraged. And that tradition sparked innovation. And Tuscan food is endlessly innovative. I mean, you've been on a trail of crumbs yourself seeking home seeking you know the food that is from where you were born and everyday korean really connects you to that uh culture that you never really lived in but always have felt connected to right right i think for me i've I guess I've always thought of things as, like Korean food as a cuisine of adoption for me, even though I was born there I was and I was, I was adopted and I was raised in New Orleans. So people look at me and th expect me to make kimchi and, you know, all these Korean recipes when really in my heart, you know, I lived in Provence in France for 10 years. You know, I, I grew up in New Orleans, so I can just as happily and easily make um, you know, a, a French braise as well as gumbo or jambalaya. So I think food is so interesting in, in the adoption of it and how it can bring us back home. Um, and yes. working on Everyday Korean was, was fascinating because I learned so much about my home cuisine, um, which was really a cuisine of adoption. Yes. So, and it's really, there are funny parts in your, in, in a place in the world where I can really identify with this because I grew up in the South as well and how the desserts are so sweet. And it was so funny how you're in <laughs> Tuscany making, recreating these Southern um, desserts with all this sugar. Yes. The Italians are just kind of like, oh, okay, yes. I'll have a little vincotto instead. <laughs> so I think one do of you the modify, you know, according one of the uh, early early things I served when we first started having Italian people over was pecan pie. And they went, what is this, you know? It was just too sweet. <laughs> it was just too sweet for words. So um, I've kind of quit yeah, serving my just... desserts here, but um, <laughs> I still love them. They're still the best. Italian desserts don't have much sugar. They need more sugar. No. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Dottis, we had we had so much fun cooking in your kitchen. Yes. Um, we got it. Kim came over and helped when I did the photographs for um, Tuscan Sun Cookbook. So we've cooked 
all those recipes and photograph them as well. That was fun. I still use that cookbook twice a week because it has all my favorite recipes in it. Yes, I just made this formata. Them, just this week, cookbook. <laughs> oh, I loved those. That was so fun to cook. Um, I don't know if, if Michael's going to cut us off soon, but I just, for those of you who haven't read the book, this isn't going to be a spoiler <laughs> alert, but I really want to read just the very last paragraph of, of the book itself because just it's so poetic and um, I'm just going to read the last part. I know they're in there, all the ones I love with all the ones I lost, sprawled on cushions, reading or gathering in the kitchen around the cakes and wine. They are by now at home in this world, although home is an enigma inside a conundrum, dipped in acid, rinsed in rain, shiny slick as a newborn, a place under the skin, under the moon, a pivot, a bolt hole, and a floor plan of planet Earth. And I just, that just resonates and stays with me. And um, I'm just so grateful that you wrote this book, Francis, because I think obviously it's a universal theme. We're all searching for home. What makes us feel at home in the world? And there's so many life lessons in this book. So thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you so much. I hope I see you in person soon. <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll probably come see you in Durham this fall again. Okay. Okay. And then we'll, Tuscany in March. <laughs> that was lovely. Thank you. So, it was fun. Uh, it's always fun to talk thank to Kim. You for having us. <laughs> <laughs> it's always talk, fun to talk about home and Italy and travel and food. Yeah. And read about it as well. Absolutely. So. Well, let's just segue from that last food conversation. Um, Linda from San Diego says that she made your pomerola sauce last night to put over uh, melanzane fritte, um, fried eggplant. Um, is there a recipe that evokes a sense of home for you or a go-to that you often make when you arrive home from somewhere else? Oh, but when I arrived back in the U US, you know, our, our just go-to is Tuscan ragu, no matter where we are. And as soon as we get home, we have this huge pot. So we make a triple recipe of ragu, and we freeze, freeze, freeze uh, portions of it. So that even getting back to North Carolina, that's still about the first thing we do is make a huge ragu. Same thing when we get here. It's just the way we get started in our place to settle in with this home life food, as our Danish friends call it. The life dish. And, and that ragu recipe is in a place in the world as well. Yeah, right? it is. That particular mm -hmm. one. Yes. Yeah. Um, Neha writes, um, I read A Year in Provence by Peter Maley last year, and it had an indelible effect on me about the value of community and great food. Your work reminds me of his because you're both such gifted writers. Were there any travel memoirs that inspired you in your writing? Oh, so many. I always loved the travel narrative, and I read them all the time. I particularly early on fell in love with Freya Stark. She was an American woman uh, who, an English woman, actually, I think. Um, English, she traveled to Assyria and says that women just didn't go at that time. And she wrote about it so beautifully. She has five or six books that I really loved. I have always read um, Patrick Lee. He writes a lot about Greece and he kind of, showed me Greece and um, just so many people who write about place like Jose Maria Arguedas um, showed me Peru. It feels like Aram Pamuk showed me Istanbul. There's so many writers that I seek out, I continue to seek out to uh, make me ready to travel again. Out of Egypt by Asiman, excellent, wonderful book. 
Anne Cornelison's Tori Greca and Women of the South. She showed me what life in the South of Italy was like in a way I never would have known otherwise. And I love this travel writer hardly anyone has ever heard of named Kate Simon. She wrote a book called The Places in Between. And she introduced me to the, the places in Italy that weren't written about very much at that time. Of course, they are now, but her book was really influential too. Kim, do you have any favorites? Francis Mays, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, Kim's Trail of Crumbs. See, this is why I didn't want to wear these earbuds. They keep falling out of my ear, but. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time too. Go ahead, Francis. <laughs> Michael, I, Kim's book, Trail of Crumbs, is, is a wonderful voyage into the past, into someone's past, into a place, into um, evolution in an adult. Plus, it has a lot of great recipes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so let's see. Um, it says Susan, I don't have a last name. Susan says that she met you years ago when you were teaching at um, Cal State um, San Francisco. Um, she's a friend of Mary Julia Clemenko's. We met you um, on her and her husband's boat. What advice do you have for young writers? Oh, I remember Mary Julia very well. Um, I would say the biggest advice would be to read and to find a community. I think those are the two main things because nobody's telling you to be a writer. Uh, they're telling you to uh, get a job. You know, they're telling you <laughs> to do something practical. And um, so if you find a community, join a writing group. You're not going to learn how to write from this writing group, but, but you're going to have a sense of support and a sense that what you're doing is is important and and that it might be what you should be doing. I mean. But reading, of course, I mean, you see some of these books behind me. I'm reading all the time I have since I was this big. And I'm reading a book right now called uh, Feline Philosophy. It's a story of how cats influence the meaning of the world. <laughs> I think Jack would approve of that. <laughs> yes. Um. Let's see who says this. Somebody asks who you share your life with now. Oh, my husband, Ed. We've been here together in Tuscany all these years. And um, I have a daughter. She has a husband. I have a grandson and two cats. But I also always think of all my friends as really close, like family. Friendship has been one of the greats of my life totally important to me, all my friends. Absolutely. And you said you were working on a cookbook. Um, when, when can we expect that? It's coming out in March from Abrams. It's called Pasta Veloce, Fast Pasta. And the idea is that, that you um, put the water on to boil and make your sauce in the time it takes for the pasta, for the water to boil and pasta to cook. So everything's fast, veloce, veloce. It's, um, it's a gift to me because um, often I'm doing something until the last minute and then it's time for dinner. Oh dear, what am I going to make? So now I have <laughs> all these, all these recipes that I'll have handy. Yes, one of my friends said that the thing with school lunches is that they have to be made every day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, somebody asks, are there movies in the work, uh, in the works right now based on oh. your life, your travels, um, your home, or uh, the novel? Women in Sunlight. Right? Women in Sunlight is, um, it's in pre-production right now. That was my novel about um, three friends in North Carolina, older women who on a whim kind of on an iron whim, come to Tuscany and 
surprise themselves by trying to return to and being able to that early vision that I was talking about when you are very young, you have a vision of life and what you want to do, but life interferes and you pull this way and this way and this way. And sometimes you don't get to where you thought you were going. So they get to Italy and they find themselves able to rupture their early visions of themselves. And that was exactly what I was writing about. And it came through sense of adventure, sense of friendship, so that book is um, being made into a movie by uh, Waters End Productions. They were producers of the movie Call Me By Your Name. And uh, Tom Dolby is going to be the director. The screen, screenplay's done. With movies, you never know whether they'll actually happen. But I think it looks good. It looks like it might happen. That's great. And Tom does a good job. Yes. Um, I watched Under the Tuscan Sun on my flight home from Italy this spring, <laughs> and I had never seen it um, because I had loved the book so much. I had always been apprehensive of the movie. And yeah. <laughs> I can see why so many people love it. It's just so, it's so lush, it's so magical. Um, I was like, I don't remember that fountain there. Um, but it was, it was interesting <laughs> to see the changes in what they had amped up. And, yes. Um, yeah. No, the it fountain was a, lot of fun. was a big part of the movie, but the fountain never, never was here. It was made out of resin. Yeah. <laughs> but they, they did such a great job. At, I was in the piazza one day, and I heard this English tour guide saying to her group, "And this is Cortona's famous Baroque fountain." <laughs> 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 it's. Uh, it's it's quite amazing. Having seen Cortona before the book and, and now after the book, uh, it's, it, I'm happy that it, it didn't change more than it did in some ways, if that makes sense. Well, um, you know, the, the movie and the book were a long time ago and everything has changed all over the world. But I mean, absolutely, I know that, you know, Cortona has drastically changed because of my books but in in many ways it's changed for the better absolutely you still have you still have many people stopping in front of brahma sole right and leaving yes i had i met three lovely just... women from california this morning it's people always say well isn't it terrible that people come to your house all the time but i never have looked at it that way i think it's kind of magical to me that somebody from Latvia has read my book and has made their way to my house. How can you be bothered by that? I mean, somebody mentioned Peter Mayle earlier. I I read that he he's passed away now, but um, I read that he was driven out of his house because people were bothering him so much and that people tried to get in his swimming pool. What happened here? I said to Ed, I think the people who read my books are nicer than the people who read his. So we've, <laughs> we've, loved, <laughs> we've really loved meeting people here. And the books in uh, 57 languages, we get people from everywhere. I saw someone who's here from Brazil. We get lots of people from Brazil, lots from Poland. It's pretty fun to meet all these people. Absolutely. Um, how is the I swimming pool coming along? Yours. Swimming pool's done, and it's been a lifesaver because we've had the hottest summer ever. It's just been blistering. That happened after you left, Michael. Yeah. This heat wave. Yeah, we just go submerge ourselves up to here. You know? <laughs> Perfect. I'm sorry, Kim, I interrupted you. Oh, oh no, I was just saying uh, to go back to all of these people coming to Brahma Soli from all over the world and that, you know, Francis views that as something so lovely. It's a gift. And, and I think that goes to your generosity of spirit and, and why, why you have been able to make homes and friendship over the years. And it's, it's, it's truly remarkable. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, somebody's comments in the chat, how much she enjoys hearing about your grandson, Will, on your travels. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. 
he's in college now, so we don't get to see him as much. It's sad. But he's having is a good he, time. <laughs> is he back in Asia? No, he's a, he's a student at NYU High, but he can't get back right now because right. of COVID there. So he's studying at NYU in New York this semester, but yeah. he's hoping to get back in January. Nice. He's studying international law and he loves being in that part of the world and being able to travel out from there. He definitely caught the travel gene. He's, he's got it. The travel bug. <laughs> Um, somebody asks, Jenny asks, are there any other places in the world um, that you would love to make a home if given the chance? Oh, oh, I, I fell in love with Portugal when I was there, but I don't think I could ever learn the language. I think it's just really a difficult language, but I absolutely loved Portugal. I really liked Spain. Mexico was my very first foreign love and yeah mexico i'm really anxious to get back to mexico city i haven't been in years um it's it's really a very fast changing international city now and i need to see it it is. it's it's pretty amazing i was there a couple years ago and the food the museums, uh -huh. the life of the place. It's fabulous. It really is. Yes. I would go back in a heartbeat. Yeah, uh, me uh, too. So where are you off to next? I'm returning to the United States in two weeks. Oh, wow. And then I'll okay. be doing, you know, some book touring and uh, Washington and New York this fall, but probably won't be traveling internationally again until the new year. How about you, oh, next place I want to go is Prague. I've never been there. You and I talked about that, I think, Michael, didn't we? Yeah. I have never been to Prague, and I've never been to Egypt. So I have a list. India, my goodness. <laughs> Francis, remember we were going to walk? We were going to walk from Bratislava to Prague. Yes. And then we got COVID. canceled. I think we still need to make that journey. Yes, I think so, too. It was such a nice walk, but it got canceled because of COVID. I was supposed to go to India um, in, in March of 2020 for a wedding. Um, it was to happen in a palace uh -huh. in the mountains outside Jaipur on the first oh, day of spring. Wow. And that, of course, got, oh. got canceled as yeah. well. Um, so all these all these nice comments in chat. I love having an audience from all over. It's very exciting. I um, want to encourage everybody again to um, order books, um, either from Warwick's or from Rakestraw Books. Um, if you click through to either rakestrawbooks.com or I think it's warwicksbooks.com, um, you can order books by Francis, by Kim, um, by anybody else. So um, any more questions before we, we end today's event? Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you, especially to the two of you. Um, Warwicks.com, Julie says. Sorry about that. So Warwicks.com and Rakestrawbooks.com. Um, I want to thank both of you for joining us. Thank you, Kim, um, thank for you. missing this morning's farmer mar farmer's market. <laughs> thank you so much. And, uh, <laughs> Maybe you can still thank make you, it. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Michael and Julie. No, I'll still make it to the market. Kim. Michael, can you pull us into the green room still again or no? Are we all I done? I can no, that works. try. Um, I will end the broadcast and then I'll try to pull you back into the green okay. room. Okay. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Francis. Thanks for okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much.